Hello out there. Guess what? We're on the air. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, YouTube. Good morning, Zap.stream. I doubt anybody's there yet, but just in case, we're live. Perfect. How are we doing? How happy Monday? Is it a happy Monday? I don't know. Too soon to say at this point. Johnny's here, though. Jose is here. Jason is here. Tommy's here. And of course, our guy Rock and Roll is here. Over on Zap.stream, what's up there? And Zombie, aka Jose. Jose is in both chats this morning. Look at this. Here's a new face in the chat. Karos Diecast. Karos Diecast. Good name. Good face. Good to see you. Rick, good morning. Yes, yeah, smash the likes if you haven't yet. That's a great point from Rick, as always. Let's see if we're, yeah, there we are. Okay, we're good. Lots of likes have been smashed, it looks like. We're going to have a Monday here, folks. Look at the title of the show. Even Bitcoiners are underestimating Bitcoin. We got lots to talk about. We got a short amount of time to do it. We got a really interesting second part of the show on living in the future today. We're going to have a good morning. Ryan, good morning, my friend. Oh, it's good to see everybody. Good to be back. Okay, well, where should we start this morning? Um, I'll start with the metrics. This is the daily Bitcoin journey. Man, this channel is growing pretty well right now. I'm, I'm, it's, been, uh, it's been quite the month, and I expect it to, just like Bitcoin, as we go through these next couple months, to really explode here. Uh, but it's great to see. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to everybody who's been showing up every single morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time. The Daily Bitcoin Journey is focused on actionable and logical discussion for Bitcoiners and for future Bitcoiners. So today's show is going to be for both the Bitcoiners and the future Bitcoiners. And I get I got a fun show coming up this week, too. I don't I don't want to give anything away, but I got a fun show coming up for Bitcoiners. I think you're going to like it a lot. <clears throat> But in the meantime, let's get to some metrics today. Let's see what's going on. I didn't spend a whole lot of time. Uh, where are we here? Window. I didn't spend a whole lot of time in Bitcoin this weekend. It was holy. What is going on here? 200 sats per V-byte. Let's check this out. Okay, first things first. Bitcoin's fourth halving is in 661 blocks right at the top there. 661 blocks. On average, there's about 140 blocks that are mined every single day. So we're getting close. We're getting very close. This is a big halvings are a big deal in Bitcoin. And we're gonna we're gonna live through one here in the next four days or so. So with that, we are currently at block height 839339. If you are transacting on the Bitcoin layer one today, I hope you're not. But if you are, you're paying a lot. You're paying way too much fees, way too many fees. Let's check out and see how much this miner made. Let's see how much F2, F2 pool made from this last block. 8.71 Bitcoin valued at approximately 614 thousand dollars so that's what you see when the fees get up because every single transaction fee that you pay on the uh, bitcoin layer one network goes to the miners so his, like the last couple months these fees have been about 0.3 of a bitcoin because fees have been so low but this block this last block with fees being 200 sats per v byte the miner got 2.4 worth of bitcoin just in fees so good for them good to see that Let's see what's going on in the world of the price. 65, I don't know if that's accurate. Yes, it is. $65,000 US. We dropped from last show we did was 70,000. So we're about five, five or 6,000 bucks down from last time. It was a crazy weekend, crazy weekend in Bitcoin. I don't really know what happened still, to be honest with you. Apparently World War III broke out. Uh, I didn't see that till the next day, so I would have, I would have been in some trouble there. <laughs> I 
But anyways, we're still here. 2023, one year ago today, you could have purchased a Bitcoin for 30,000 bucks. And four years ago today, 6,600 US dollars. The Moscow time this morning, one US dollar, 1,500 sats. The price in Canada today, still above 90,000 bucks, 90,683 Canadian monopoly illusionary dollars. Castro, Castro bucks. <laughs> And the moose jaw time this morning here in Canada, one Canadian dollar, one loony will get you 1100 sats. If you got a toonie, the coin with the polar bear on it, you can get 2200 sats. The deal of a lifetime. There is no doubt about that. And we have 661 blocks until that halving kicks in. So with that having, let's look at this quickly again. So you see the subsidy in the fees here, 8.71 Bitcoin that went to the miner. In this case, F2 pool. No, this is the wrong block. Uh, this miner F2 pool got 8.2 Bitcoin. 6.25 of that was the subsidy. And then the 2.009 was from the fees. So in five days, this is pretty much going to get cut in half. So miners are going to be in some trouble for a little while, I think. But that's part of their industry. That's part of their business is managing cash flow, managing the cycles. And those who do it well will be around. Those who don't, adios. Look at this. New face in the chat. Once again, Colin Lindsay. Good morning. It's good to see you here. Thanks for being here. And if you are a Bitcoiner, I do suggest Zap.Stream. Zap.Stream is the YouTube version for Bitcoin. You can get there, you can go to bitcoinjourney.ca slash stream, and you can get, that'll redirect you right to the feed. It's pretty cool. We got Tommy's over there testing. That's good news. That means he's a new zap.streamer. And Jose says, I wasn't worried about World War III because they didn't stop the masters. I was actually waiting for that. I was waiting for the masters to stop because of the what was going on. But it didn't. Mav is here. Good morning. King, best name in the chat. Good morning. And Mav says, only thing that happened this weekend was Scotty domination. Holy. Holy, holy, holy. Dan, good morning, my friend. So on that, quickly on the Masters, because it, it, it was, it is and was the best weekend of the year, the Masters. I was watching it the entire day. I managed to get some work done as well while I was watching. But Scotty Scheffler, holy cow. I have learned my lesson officially, officially. Put this on the record. Put this on the internet. I will never, ever bet against Scotty Scheffler again in my life. I don't bet much. I don't bet often. I only bet on golf. And the last five, ten, how many pools have we done? I always bet against Scotty. And even bets I took. I took Auburn yesterday. So I've learned my lesson. I'm never, ever betting against Scotty. But I also learned another lesson yesterday. And that is how good Ludwig Oberg is going to be and is now. So here's what I'm going to do. Every single tournament, <laughs> this is what I decided yesterday. I was so impressed with Oberg. Every single golf tournament going forward, I'm going to throw some money on him. Not, not betting against Scotty, but I'm going to throw some money on Oberg to finish in the top 10. In every single tournament, he plays for the rest of his life. And I'm going to I'm gonna track all this. Maybe I'll show it on the show here if there's some golf fans and the progress with it. But I'm going to bet every tournament. I'm going to put all of my proceeds directly into Bitcoin. And when I get ahead, if I get ahead. So that's the plan. Yeah, Oberg, he is, he is something. He is a golfer. He's going to be the guy in the future. He can drive it better than anybody I've ever seen before. He can putt incredibly well. And he's just a very likable guy. So I can get behind him for sure. And look at this comment. Great content. Been listening for a while. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate that. So on that note, on that note, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start a new little segment of the show here. And I don't know if I'm, I'm thinking people will like it, but who knows? We're going to try it out. This is actually going to be called the Daily Block Reward. 
this is a new segment on the show. As of this morning, I came up with this idea. So here's what we're going to do. Every single morning, we're going to go through a comment. This could be from YouTube. This could be from Fountain. This could be from anywhere. But we're going to talk about a comment. And so the one I want to talk about this morning, and actually on that note, I should give a couple more shout outs here. Because uh, people have been listening. To, I, every day I upload this show onto a podcast version. I upload it to Anchor, which goes out to Spotify. It goes out to Fountain. And I think 80% of the listeners on there are from Fountain. So I want to give a shout out to them. Fountain's pretty cool. It's like the zap.stream version of podcasts. On there, you can actually stream sats or you can send a boost. So you hook it up to your Lightning Network or your Lightning Wallet. And you can earn Bitcoin just for listening to podcasts on Fountain, which I highly suggest every single person who is watching the show now or later, get the Fountain app, hook it up to your Lightning Wallet and start earning sats just for listening to podcasts. That's number one. But the second part is every one of my shows is on there. So you can go on there, you can send a boost, you can send 100 sats, 1,000 sats, a million sats, and you can leave a little message on there. So I'm going to be reading the, uh, probably the top one from Fountain if there's anything on there. But if there's nothing on Fountain, I'm going to start reading comments from YouTube. And just uh, whether they're good, bad, not bad, whether they're good or constructive, we'll say. I'm not going to entertain any dummies online ever. Why isn't this working for me here? I'm trying to bring up this comment that I found this morning. There we go. Please work. There we go. Okay. So here's the comment. This is a nice one. I wanted to start this one for the week because I don't know. It's good. It's positive. So this is from our, our buddy, K-Fen, K-Fren. And the comment is, you should have more than 20 likes. And this is referring to a video called Selling My Rental House for Bitcoin. And they said, you should have more than 20 likes on this video. Count mine as two. So just, I mean, that's the comment. But one thing I'd say on that is, number one, Bitcoiners and this community are very supportive people. There's hardly been any bad comments in any of my videos, mostly because I just speak logically. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. But at the same time, it's like, what is it like? It's just a number. It's a metric. It makes people feel good. But that comment there, count minus two, that's why I do it. That's why I show up every day. Not for the number of likes, but for the people who are here and for the people who are getting something from these videos. So big shout out to KFRN. 19191919191. <laughs> I appreciate that. So that's the new thing we're going to start doing on the show. Add it to our daily routine. That's the daily block roar. So I'm going to read one comment from YouTube. Actually, I'm going to put a priority on the biggest boost on Fountain. So if you got something nice to say, something constructive to say, or you want to promote whatever you're doing, whether that's a business, meetup, whatever, the priority will be for Fountain listeners and anybody who sends a boost. But if there's no boosts, then we'll read a comment from YouTube. That's the daily block reward. <clears throat> so there we go. Uh, AD. Another new face. Love that. Got an oster after your like first. Oh, there you go. There you go. There's another one. There's another daily block reward. Back to back blocks here. So AD says, I got an oster after your like versus zap live stream and I'm loving it. Hell yeah. So on that, let's, let's talk about this because the, the theme of today's show is going to be how much people are underestimating Bitcoin and just how much opportunity and potential and what's coming here in Bitcoin. Wait till you guys listen to this video. I'm going to show after the main show here. But think about it. Think about, every, think about where we are right now. And one of the piece of news here today is that the Hong Kong Bitcoin ETF is live today. So that's going to bring, they're, they're talking that it's going to bring about $25 billion worth of capital into Bitcoin, new demand for Bitcoin, 25 billion. And if you consider where we are today at about 65, 70,000 bucks price wise, 
that that movement is from January until April. That's when the American ETFs were approved. And so if you consider everything that happened there, there was about four or five billion dollars worth of new inflow, not from Grayscale, but new inflow into Bitcoin was about four or five billion dollars. And they're expecting this one to be 25 billion worth of new demand for Bitcoin. So we went from 40 to 70 in those short months based on four or five billion worth of new Bitcoin, new demand. And people talk about the Bitcoin multiplier. I think as, especially after this halving, but as the supply continues to go down, that multiplier is going to go up. And so obviously the 25 billion isn't going to flow into Bitcoin today, but it is going to sometime this year. So we got the halving, we got the American ETF, we got the Hong Kong ETF now. And th this is the exponential growth part of Bitcoin, is that we are still the less than 1% of people who are in Bitcoin. And it's probably 0.0001% of people who actually understand Bitcoin and understand what they're holding. So we still have so many people to come in here. And it's the exact same with Noster. Think about Noster. How many people, we'll do a little, we'll do a little experiment here. How many people were on Noster this time last year? Or let's say how many people got into Noster in the last two or three months from watching this show? Let's go with that. If you just, if you downloaded Noster, if you started an account on Noster within the last three or four months, since I've been talking about it often on the show, put your hand up in the chat. Because I, I want to see here how many people, this is the exponential growth part of Bitcoin and from Noster is, is the more, you know, I tell five people, five people sign up, those five people tell their friends, all of a sudden it turns into 25 people. And that's the power of exponential growth, which we're about to live through here in Bitcoin. Pal says, how are you going to celebrate the halving? It's a good question. What are we uh, what are we looking at in terms of when it's going to happen right now? Where are we right now? Let's see. I think it was a April 19th, 10 p.m. So it still could change. It's been going down and down. So that means the, the blocks have been coming in faster, which means that there's more people mining Bitcoin right now. So right now we have April 19th, 10 p.m. So my plan right now is to do a show on Friday night for the halving. And I, I think there'll probably be a lot of different shows on Bitcoin for the halving, but that's okay. You can kind of, you can kind of choose which one you want to watch, but we'll, we'll do it probably Friday night. We'll have a couple beers. We'll watch that block go from 839,999 to 840 crossing into the new halving epoch. I think it'll be pretty fun. So that's the plan as of now. Uh, where are we here? That takes up so much data there for broadband, I guess. you. Okay. So here we are. Leon, there we go. Here's, here's a new Noster user. Leon, good morning. What is Noster? That's a great question. It's a protocol right now. That's what we're going to call it. It's a protocol. Think of the internet. Think of email. Think of Bitcoin. Those are all protocols. They're not companies. They're not anything else but their protocols. So Nostra is a protocol. On top of that are a bunch of different clients being built. And so the beauty of that is a couple things. I think the main thing that people will like from Nostra, if you're a Bitcoiner, is that you can send Bitcoin back and forth. Instead of liking some post, you can actually send Bitcoin. You can send a zap. So if you're posting on Nostra, if you're putting your stuff out on Nostra, whatever it is that you like to talk about and people are getting value from that, they can send you Bitcoin in return. And the beauty of that is if you compare it to our existing system, how we have it, think about how long it takes to set up a YouTube channel or a Instagram account, a TikTok channel. They're all, so, they're all so saturated too. So with Nostra, you can actually get on there. And that day, if you're providing value to people, whatever it is you're talking about, but if you're pre if you're creating value for people, you can send or you can receive Bitcoin that day. You don't have to have X amount of followers. You don't have to have any sponsors. 
You don't have to have X amount of watch hours or listening hours. If you do something that day that somebody else gets value from, they can send you Bitcoin on Noster. So I'd say that that's probably like the, it was funny on the weekend, Jack had a po- Jack Dorsey had a post on Noster talking about how Noster doesn't have like the, the one thing, which Twitter had, it was the 140 characters, but Noster doesn't have that one thing. But I disagree with that. I think that zaps are that one thing. And once people realize that, once people understand what you can do on Noster and all the influencers from all these other legacy platforms start coming over to Noster, it's just going to explode. So that's the first part. But another big one is the censorship resistant aspect of it. So with, with Noster, you just get a public key and a private key. That's how you set up, similar to like a username and password. So you get a public key and a private key. You can actually use that private key to access any single app, we'll call it, it's a client, but a, any single application is built on Noster. So if you say something on Domus, which is a app for Noster, that Domus doesn't like, you can just, they'll kick you off of there, but you can take your private key and you can put it into any other client and your exact same feed is going to show up there. Everybody you're following, everybody that was following you, nothing changes. So you don't need a different account for Instagram. You don't need a different account for Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You just have one public key and that's how you access every single client on Noster. So uh, Dan says, started on a Noster with Astra last year and eventually gave up trying to use it. Switched to Primal after watching your channel and now having a much better experience. There we go. Love that. So that's what I would say to you, Leon, is start with, go to the App Store today, download Primal or download Domus. Those are kind of my two main ones for mobile. And just set up an account, start interacting on there. It's a much different experience. It's a much different interaction on there. It's just so refreshing, honestly. I go onto Twitter for five minutes and my blood pressure shoots through the roof. It's just a bunch of arguing. It's just a bunch of this versus that, left versus right. It's insane. There's no, there's nothing productive that happens on Twitter. You go over to Noster and it's all Bitcoin. It's not all Bitcoiners, but that's kind of like the Bitcoin mentality over there is that it's just people providing value to people, people helping other people. If you have a question, instead of going to Google, you type it into Noster, you use the hashtag ask Noster and ask Noster and somebody's going to help you. And if they do, you can send them Bitcoin. If you help somebody else, they can send you Bitcoin. It's just a totally different experience over there. Yeah, Jose says Twitter is not a healthy place. I think that's the understatement of the year. So try that out. Then you can connect it to zap.stream. You can send some zaps. You can zap comments. You can zap the show. It's just a, it's a different world here that we're going into. Uh, Pal says, link to guide for using Noster, please. Mm. I'll, I'll try to remember to do that because I did do a video on it. It was months ago, though. I should probably do another update on that, honestly. Another update video. Uh, link to Noster. One thing I would say is that our living in the future group, like our private tier membership, we put a big focus on Noster. So everybody on there, everybody in the community has an Oster. We all support each other. We boost each other's stuff on there. And that's kind of what we're, where we're living now. So I've done a few videos in the private channel about Noster, not just how to get set up, but how to actually take advantage of this time and how to navigate Noster, what you can be doing, how to get followers, how to interact on there, some, ti- some tips, tricks, uh, because it, it's a little bit different than what we're used to. So consider that. Basically, all you'd have to do is join the Living in the Future tier. And within that, there's a bunch of collections that I have. So there's like Bitcoiners, there's Noster, there's Understanding Bitcoin, there's a bunch more. But you can go to the Noster collection and you can see the videos I've done on Noster. Uh, AD says, what is Twitter implementing a feature like Zaps? I feel like that would slow the migration from Twitter to Noster. So that's a good question. And I'm sure that Elon probably could implement Zaps tomorrow if you wanted to. 
I do think that Twitter will probably have something similar in terms of maybe Doge or Lightning or both. But the way, kind of what I think is going to happen here, I think that Twitter eventually will get onto Nostra because Twitter could hook up to Nostra any day if they wanted to. The difference there is that Twitter uses centralized servers. Um, so every time you do something, it goes back to the centralized server and they store it there and then they send it out. That's why there's more of a delay between Twitter and Noster. Whereas Noster, it's all just relays. There's no centralized servers there. It's all just going, all the information, all the data is going back between relays. So Twitter could hook up to Noster tomorrow if they want to. And they probably will. It'll look different than like a Domus though, because Domus doesn't use algorithms. They don't have ads. They don't have any of that. Twitter could use uh, the Noster protocol and look the exact same as it does today. They could use algorithms. They could have ads on there. So I do think that that's coming. We're just not quite there yet. Uh-oh. Noah's over in the Zaptot stream chat. And she says, my audio is not working today. Is the audio? I'm guessing people can hear me. So that's that. Uh, what's next here? Oh, this was a cool one. This is a really cool one. I want to start with this one. So this is the news part of today. We're going to start with the Bitcoin news. And believe it or not, this segment is sponsored by Bitcoin news, who I did see on Twitter this morning is going to be doing a live stream today and they have an announcement on there. So I'll definitely be tuning into that, see what's going on over at Bitcoin news. I saw that Robert, which is the CEO, I believe over at Bitcoin news, he's going to be the one talking today on the live. So make sure to get over to their Twitter account. They're also on Noster, of course, but uh, find a way to get onto the, I think it's the Twitter spaces though that they're using today. So here's the Bitcoin news for today. Let's start with this one. This is really cool. In my opinion, anyways. I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth in this for uh, living in the future today as well. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> on the weekend, I signed out of my Google again. So on YouTube, there's a switch profile button. And right underneath there is log out. And if you click log out, it logs you out of every single uh, Gmail account. And of course, it's a nightmare to try to get back into any single one of them. Okay, we're in. So let's start with this one. This one's really cool. Where is it? There. Okay, I'm going to take myself, I'm going to mute myself, I'm going to bring this up. And we're going to watch this. This is a uh, <laughs> so a couple of years ago, here, I'll take this off for a sec. A couple of years ago, I invested into a, it's like a venture capital fund for Bitcoiners. So we, we pay a monthly contribution. There's a share to, to invest into it. I think there's still some shares available, actually. So if, if you watch this and if you're interested, we're going to talk about more. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit more on the private show today. But if you're interested in joining this, it's a venture cap group. It's about 2000 bucks to, en to enter. And then you pay a monthly contribution. And what this fund does is it actually helps out Bitcoin companies and, and actually other cryptocurrency companies, which say what you want, but there are going to be some cryptocurrencies that are actually uh, valuable in the future and adding value into the ecosystem here. So the, the venture cap fund invests in these different startups within Bitcoin at the very early days, the seed, the seed level. And so if you think about this, like our stock market, how, the, how every company works in the legacy system is that they do a, a seed round. So if you wanted to start a company, you would seek out some private investors, the, the guys who are in the know, they would have a chance to buy up your company before it has any sort of value at a very, very low price. And then once, there's some traction there. Once there's some sales and it's an actual company, they go public. And so the people who get in at the seed phrase, let's say they buy the share for like five bucks a share. Once it goes public, 
think about how many more people are out there for to invest. So the price goes from five to say five hundred dollars a share. But it's the people who are there at the very beginning, the seed level, that's who makes all the money in investing. So this this venture cap fund is investing in at that level in Bitcoin companies. So let's watch this. This is one of the clients that we invested in or one of the companies we invested in. They're from El Salvador and pretty cool. I saw this pop up on Bitcoin news yesterday. This is open a open your lightning wallet, create an invoice and QR for two thousand nine hundred and eighty six. So I, I make a QR code for that much. Yeah. I'm not sure that it actually needs to be 2,986. All right, so I'm creating an invoice. Okay, so, hey, look at that, I got it. All right, that's cool. Yeah. Hey man, thanks Will. Sure. Yeah, K1 Mini. That's badass. So that K1 mini, those are little mini Bitcoin ATMs. And you can see there, you just pump some cash into it, some dollar bills. It provides you with, uh, it says, create an invoice for X amount of sats based on how many dollars you put in. You create an invoice, you scan it on their little scanner and it sends you Bitcoin. So one, the one thing I noticed about that is in the living in the future group, there's a lot of talk about different ways to get non KYC sats. And a lot of the Bitcoin ETMs, you have to put in an email address, you have to put in uh, maybe some ID, but with that one, it looks like you could do it just with inserting cash. It sends you sats to your lightning wallet and nobody would ever know that it was you who did that. You put in cash, they sent you sats, no KYC. And think about the, I love the mini aspect of that too, as well, because Think about how many businesses are out there, like convenience stores. And instead of having like a whole, you know, eight foot high, three feet wide ATM in there, th these little mini ones will actually probably sit on a counter somewhere, take up less space and provide the convenience stores or whoever ha has these with some additional income every month in Bitcoin, just by having that machine there. So I do want to eventually get one of these machines set it up in my town here. Johnny says he's used that machine. I think that Johnny is also part of the group that I'm in investing group. So that that's an example. <laughs> that's a company from El Salvador. We invested them like a year or two ago at a very, I think we got five or 10% of their company. And so now I just saw this tweet on that was from Bitcoin news tweeted that on the weekend. So that was pretty cool. Uh, King says, how are the fees? And Johnny says, the owner of the machine sets the fees. So what you can actually do is you can actually order one of these K1 minis, set it up wherever you want. You set the fee, as Johnny says here, and that's what it is. So the fee, the fee would be like the spread there. So if somebody's buying Bitcoin, let's say the price is 100,000 bucks. You, you create the spread. You say that you're not selling Bitcoin for less than 110,000. So you earn the spread there on the fees. Pretty badass, pretty badass. So like I said, I do think that there's spots still available in that venture cap group. There's only gonna be, I think it's 1700 people, which I liked because I like smaller companies, smaller setups and smaller funds, just because you get more out of it that way, right? Uh, what's the next one here? This, this, is, <laughs> this is pretty funny too. Okay, let me take this off. Pal says, mind blown, I want one, uh, right? Like think about how, so AD says what happens to the fiat. So essentially what you would do there is that you would get this K1 machine, you'd load it with Bitcoin, 
And every time somebody puts dollars in, you sell them that Bitcoin. It's I'm guessing it's your Bitcoin that you're putting in there. So think about that. And if you're somebody who has Bitcoin today at this price, think about how much leverage you're going to have in the future. And this is just one example of that. So all of a sudden you have all this Bitcoin built up. Bitcoin's worth $1, one sat, 100 million bucks. And all of a sudden you buy a couple of these ATMs, put them around your area. And every week you just do a loop. You, you send the Bitcoin machines, Bitcoin fund it, keep it funded. You don't have to go there to put in cash, but every week you just do a loop around your area, pick up all the cash and that's your cash. That's what happens to the, the fee out there is that you get it. So you fund the ATM, you get the cash back. So Johnny says, I almost bought one and still might. I'm definitely going to be buying one of these because it's a no brainer. If you're somebody who's in Bitcoin now, instead of opening up like your own bank and lending out, just get a couple of those K1 machines, set them up in your area, fund it with Bitcoin. You're helping people get Bitcoin in a non-KYC fashion and you are getting cash in return for that. So then it's like, I mean, just, just taking it one step further here, this is the kind of stuff that you want in life. So you're taking advantage of your Bitcoin that you have. This is assuming that it's going to be worth a lot more and you actually want to part with some of it. But you could either, you could take that cash and you could buy more Bitcoin or you could take that cash and use that as like your food for the, for the month. So you go to your local rancher, your meat store, you take all the cash out of your ATMs, you go buy meat for the week. And that's how you essentially buy meat with Bitcoin is you're selling Bitcoin to other people. You're taking their cash and you're going to the store. Even if they don't accept Bitcoin at your meat store, you're taking that cash there and giving it to them. And people love cash. So you might even get a bit of a discount on there for, for um, using cash. Uh, Letha says, does Ben have one in his, his Sarasota club? I would assume so. Oh, Johnny says yes. Pretty badass. So here we go. <laughs> so Jose, actually, shout out to uh, to Noah over in the chat. She's, she zapped 21 sats. And Jose says, wow, Will is a legend. Not the person I was expecting to build that. <laughs> I don't think Will was... So Will was the old guy at the end of that video. I don't think that he was the builder of that. I think that he was the guy working the booth at the trade show for K1. But really sweet guy nonetheless. And Jose also zapped a thousand sats over in Zap.stream. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate that a lot. And uh, Jose says, what's the company for that? K1. Yes. So I'm guessing you can go to their website, K1 Mini ATMs. You can, I'm guessing they're about a thousand bucks, a couple thousand bucks. They ship it to you. You set it up wherever you want. And I don't know. I think that that's a brilliant way to earn some money in the future, some Bitcoin and some money. So I wanted to share that with you. Pretty cool. And the cool thing is, is if you're, if you're somebody who wants to take it, you know, further than that with, with the, the founders group, it's called, that's the investment fund. Since we own 10% of that company, we're going to get all of the sales from that. And I'm sure that every time there's a sale on the machine, they get some Bitcoin just for facilitating that. That would be my guess. So let's say 1% of every transaction goes to K1's Bitcoin wallet. That's how I would set it up. I don't know if that's how it is, but that's how I would. So if you want to actually own the company instead of just the ATMs, um, find a way to get in touch with me and I'll put you, you can check it out. You'd, you'd actually be a part owner of that company just by buying a share because we already have the investment. So you're still not paying a premium for it yet until all the shares sell out. Pretty cool. I'll add that link to the bottom there as well for K1. And just like every day, if, if you need anything from me, everything that I talk about on the show is always going to be in the description of the video. So that's how you do it. There's an email, there's a Noster, there's everything. 
Okay, we got a nice comment here from Aaron. He says, Bitcoin was created by the NSA to take pressure off gold. New face? Oh, no, I've seen Aaron Haywood before, I think. 7.0. I think I laughed at that account last time because it's 7.0. You think that Bitcoin's going to get rug pulled? I would love, I would love to hear how you actually think that the NSA could rug pull Bitcoin. I do agree. I agree with you. I think that the the NSA was the the people who did create Bitcoin, the government of the US uh, or a certain subset of the government. But I also think that they did it. It was good people within that group who did it because you you have to think of every single entity on earth. Every single entity, government the World Economic Forum, every single entity is made up of just people. That's all it is. It's just a bunch of people who are collected into an organization, a company, an entity. It's just people. So within every one of those companies, including the NSA, there are good people. And there are people who split off and do their own thing after. There are people who, once they realize what's going on there, they take a different route or they change things within there. And I do think because of the... SHA-256 algorithm was created by the NSA. And I also think that they created Bitcoin. I could be wrong. But the thing about Bitcoin is now that it's released, now that it's decentralized as it is, there's no way for the NSA or anybody to stop it. That's the good news. There's no way that they can rug you on your Bitcoin. Satoshi Nakamoto translated in Japanese means central intelligence. Maybe it does. But if, if you know what you're doing with Bitcoin, there are ways to be private with it. And at the same time, this is kind of my, this is my opinion on that in terms of central intelligence. Think about how our money works right now, Aaron. Every transaction you do, everything's digital right now. Every transaction you do, somebody knows about. The intelligence knows about it. So that's you. So you're kind of used to that already. At the same time, Think about our governments. Do our governments have any sort of accountability, any sort of transparency with our fiat? Or can they just, you know, offshore some over to um, the Cayman Islands or to Hong Kong or to London or to Ukraine? And it comes back our way after. We don't see any of that. We don't know how much the government spends. We don't know what they're spending on. We have zero transparency in our current system. Plus, they have the ability to take on more debt, to print more money. So with Bitcoin, even if even if that's what you think is going to happen in terms of they're going to be able to see every transaction, think about the impact that's going to have on our government. If we could see every transaction that our government did and there actually had some accountability there, our world would look totally different for the much better. And, and in the same breath, the government can't print Bitcoin. They can't create new Bitcoin. That's the problem with every single part of our society right now is that the people on the top, the people pulling the strings, they're the ones who control the money. They control the money. They can print the money. They can take on more debt. Who do we owe? (laughs) Sorry, this is a little bit of a tangent here, but think about the U.S. government. 34 point what? Trillion dollars worth of debt. To who? To who? Who does the U.S. government owe $34 trillion to? The central banks, right? And so they have the ability to just increase that anytime they want to. They, they pass through a bill. You didn't vote on it. I didn't vote on it. But all of a sudden, they've sent $5 million or $5 billion to Ukraine. And every single time they do that, that devalues your money. They can't do that with Bitcoin. So you you can, I mean, go go all over the map if you want and try to find everything wrong with Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, if you're holding fiat instead of Bitcoin, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you think. So <clears throat> Aaron says, so the U.S. government will use Bitcoin in the future to pay off future debts. There, there's no debt connected to Bitcoin. That's the, That's the difference here. With, with fiat, every time a new dollar is printed or every time they take on debt, we are the people who have to pay for it because that's how the government earns income is on the backs of its citizens. With Bitcoin, 
We're not going to need to do that. El Salvador is a perfect example of that already. Instead of using natural or instead of using human resources to earn money and to fund their government, they're using natural resources, a volcano in El Salvador to earn Bitcoin. The volcano in El Salvador using Bitcoin mining, using the natural energy that's never been tapped into before, they can mine Bitcoin. They can use that to fund their government operations. And instead of the citizens of the country having to go to work every day and pay income taxes, they're using natural resources for that. So their end goal there is to completely eliminate income taxes. So yes, some governments will try to outlaw Bitcoin. They'll try to slow it down. Uh, but there's nothing that they can do because there are governments like El Salvador who are going the opposite way. And people flock to that. People flock to efficiency and freedom. And so every country is probably going to try to stop Bitcoin or, or manipulate it somehow. But if you understand Bitcoin, there's no way for them to do that. And once you once that clicks in your head, it really demotiv demotivates you to earn fiat anymore, earn dollars, because they're they're essentially just an illusion. Bitcoin is real because it's fixed and you can't print it. Uh, King says, even if Satoshi sold his Bitcoin, the price would still recover. Other people would buy it and hold it. Yep. Bitcoin will never go to zero because I'll always pay. what If Bitcoin's a dollar, I'm paying a dollar for it. <laughs> and then probably there will be a lot more people like me who are paying for a dollar for it. And then all of a sudden, because there's only so much Bitcoin available, because there's the demand is increasing because it's only a dollar now, it'll continue to go, it'll keep going up again. That's the beauty of an asset with a fixed supply like Bitcoin. Uh, Keros says, when will mass adoption when will mass adoption occur in in your opinion? That's a good question. And actually. Let's 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 put this on the back burner for one second here. I'm going to show one more video, and then we're going to talk about this um, question. Uh, but before we do that, quick shout out to uh, Nick over in Zap Stream, Zap sixty nine Sats. He says exactly. We can always add privacy, but try sending four trillion per year through CoinJoin to launder if you are the government. So in a transparent world, we benefit. There are ways. I mean, the, the thing about Bitcoin is a lot of people think that because you can see every transaction, which I think is a beautiful thing. Last week or two weeks ago, we did a full transaction where you can set up your transaction. You set your fee, you broadcast it. It goes into the mempool and then you can follow that transaction using your transaction ID. You can follow it through the whole thing. And so that is a, that's a feature of, of layer one Bitcoin, but not everybody's going to be using layer one. In five years from now, I'm sure that your average person will never do a transaction on layer one. So with that, we're going to be using lightning and we're going to be buying things and selling things with lightning. I also bought a t-shirt on, on live show last week with lightning. So with that, my name's not connected to that at all. When you're earning Bitcoin, if I sell something online to earn Bitcoin, my name is not connected to that. So, yes, I mean, there's going to be some privacy issues for people who don't know what they're doing. And we might get in some trouble for owning Bitcoin in the future. But at the end of the day, we're going to be the ones who benefit from that <clears throat> transparency. Because they're, they already have it on us anyways. Everything's digital right now. Every time you tap your phone with your debit card, every time you tap your phone with your, your Visa card on there, it's connected to you. We already live in that world where they know every single transaction. So it can't get any worse than that. But it's going to get much worse for the people who are actually should be the ones providing this information, the accountability, the transparency, which is the government's. So nothing's going to change for us. Everything's going to change for them. Aaron says, I, I suspect Mr. 100 is Iran looking to circumvent future sanctions. Could be. If they were smart, it would be. So Mr. 100 is a, um, and that's a good example of that. <laughs> Nobody knows who Mr. 100 is. We don't anyways. So 
I mean, yeah, Bitcoin's transparent, but you don't have any names attached to your Bitcoin address. So Mr. 100 is a Bitcoin wallet that has been buying approximately 100 Bitcoin every day. And Aaron thinks it's Iran, which would be very smart on their on their part. Uh, cleaning up 12, great YouTube channel. Yo, Jor, what you saying? I don't know. I don't know what I'm ever saying. I just see I just see comments and then go off about them. <laughs> that's, pre that's pretty much the daily Bitcoin journey. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's watch this video and then we're going to talk about um, this comment here. So let me take myself off the screen. Let me bring this up. I'm sure there are some UFC fans out there who may have seen this on the weekend. This isn't his speech, by the way. He also did a speech right after his fight talking about <laughs> Austrian economics, believe it or not. Just when you think you've seen everything in the world, you see a UFC fighter in his speech after his fight talking about monetary policy and Austrian economics. That's where we are today. So here's an interview he did. I think this might have been yesterday after the fight. Anyways, let's watch it. Two minutes long. <clears throat> Bitcoin. Ah, I hear I'm not big Bitcoin. I, <laughs> Is it going crazy? And and are you a Bitcoin guy? A hundred percent. I love Bitcoin. <laughs> I love decentralization. I love the fact that uh, Bitcoin for me is not an investment, it's, it's more like a hedge fund, right? You can save your money. Because look, Ariel, before I start to learn and, uh, and understand about economics, policies and money, I used to keep my money on the bank. But people that keep their money on the bank are the biggest losers. <laughs> and they are losing the biggest losers. The biggest losers, the, the money that you have on your bank account from five years ago, you cannot buy like anything like let, let's see the inflation the, the 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 houses the cars or the whole market like every year because polished because corruption institutions because pol bad policies are destroying the value of the money and if you keep the money on your bank you're just losing money so i like bitcoin bitcoin is like a a, a way to get your money safe and to get value of the money uh, with the time, it's not an investment because it's not sure. Uh, it could goes up and down all every time, but it's better than trust in a money that is that is backed up, backed by politicians and promises, right? So uh, the dollar is not on the best place right now. That's why they are paying a lot of interest, right? Five percent interest in in some bonds and some high yield accounts. So uh, I like bitcoins. I, I like I like. What Bitcoin is doing the, is a revolutionary technology. And soon, if you don't, uh, and I always say that, what is best, to have a gun or to know how to use a gun? So if you don't have money to, to buy Bitcoin, try to learn about Bitcoin because in the, cup, in the next couple of decades, that's going to be revolutionary and that's going to change a lot of the financial institutions, in my opinion, wow. at least. How does a UFC fighter have more knowledge about monetary policy and how Keynesian versus Austrian, value added versus completely illusionary, how does he have more knowledge about this than people who have gone to school for tens, dozens of years learning about money? <laughs> As Tommy says, fighters know more than anyone in government. <laughs> wow. But I mean, the answer to that question is because it's it's by design. I went to school for six and a half years in money, in finance. And I didn't know what money was until, and my dad worked in a bank my entire life. I didn't know what money was until I actually took on the initiative and the responsibility and started educating myself on money. And then once you understand how our money works, you understand why Bitcoin has so much value. And this guy gets it. So he took his bonus also in Bitcoin. I think he won, he won 30,000 for winning, I think. I'm not a big UFC guy, but he took his Bitcoin in, or his Bitcoin, as the, as the chat's saying here, 
his Bitcoin <laughs> and bought uh, and took a Bitcoin. Tweeted about it too. So these these guys, these UFC fighters, are sure. I don't know. Pretty underrated, in my opinion. And as Nick says, he's just zapped sixty nine sats over in Zapped Out Stream based UFC. It's funny. I, I was thinking about this. There's lots of uh, comments here as well. Oh, what's happening here? Oh, 300,000. Really? Oh, I thought it was just 30,000. 300,000 makes a lot more sense. So, okay, let's let's take a step back here. Let's 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 stop this. But I was thinking about this briefly today. And think about this. Think about 4 years ago, 5 years ago back in 2019, 2018. Think about how much different the world was then. I did not know anything about what's happening in the world. I was completely, completely soaked in the legacy system. And in, in that world, you know, we'd have Hollywood, we would have musicians, we would have professional athletes. They were the ones, you know, they'd, they'd win a Grammy, they'd go up and they'd give their little speech, talk about global warming, talk about the war that's going on. <clears throat> Nobody's paying attention to those dummies anymore. Then you look at a UFC where all the eyes are from a lot of the world. That, that's where people are watching now. And you have fighters like this guy talking about Bitcoin. Last week, there was a guy talking about child trafficking. The week before that, they're talking about politicians. Like They're using their platform in, a, in an actual productive way. And there was another one I wanted to talk about too, a UFC fighter. Oh, it was the guy in Canada. He was talking about how bad our government is here in Canada. And he went viral 10 times over talking about the government. So everything's flipped on its head in the last five or six years, including public perception, the people, the influencers of the world, and everything's flipped. And it's a beautiful thing. As Letha says, F Hollywood. Man, Hollywood has never been more irrelevant than they are today <clears throat> king says once a powerful nation accumulates a lot of bitcoin what does that mean from a geopolitical point of view do they have more economic power oh yeah el salvador will be one of the most powerful countries on earth in the next couple of decades without a doubt they're buying bitcoin every day they're attracting bitcoiners there they're buying Bitcoin, they're mining Bitcoin, they're attracting Bitcoin. <laughs> King says, I don't like that he calls it Bitcoin. <laughs> that must just be his accent, eh? <laughs> uh, Brennan says, the reason Bitcoin is savings technology is the incentive to hold. You would never acquire so much fiat simply because there's no reward. Uh, you, you need NGU in order to save like a savage. What's NGU? I see all these different acronyms on Noster and stuff, and I have no idea what they are. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, let's let's talk about this here. Where's this comment here? Number go up. Gotcha. NGU. <laughs> there you go. I should know that probably. That should be one that I knew. Okay, so let's talk about this one. And we're at an hour right now, but I do want to talk about this quickly. Because it's going to actually tie into our, the next part of the show here, which we're going to hop over to living in the future. So you have a couple minutes now. You can quickly check the description, living in the future. Join that. It's free for seven days. You're going to want to listen to today's interview or discussion that we're talking about uh, because it's it's a big deal. And I don't want to show it on YouTube. I want to put it over there and then talk about it. But it, it's a big deal what's happening here in terms of the Black Rocks, the ETFs, the Hong Kongs how big this is going to be. So you got a couple minutes here while we uh, talk things through. But this is uh, the question in the chat here from, from Keros. He says, when will mass adoption occur in your opinion? And this, I'm going to give you my prediction for the next year. It's, it's absolutely impossible to look any further than that. Because I was just talking about how much the world has changed in the last four years. It's going to go exponential in these next four years. 
So this is my opinion for the next year. And I'm not going to give a price, but I am going to give you what I think, how this is going to play out. So today, Hong Kong ETFs launched. January, American ETFs launched. If you look at, and also the halving is in five days. So let's let's focus on those three things. The halving's in five days. If you look at what happened here, last halving cycle. So leading up to the 2020 halving, it happened in May 2020. Leading up to that, in March, the price dropped in half. It recovered by halving, but it dropped in half. We didn't see that this time. This time we saw an all-time high. The difference there is, is the ETFs. The floor is much more solid. The foundation, the, the buying pressure is there. And so here's what I think is going to happen. We're going to hit the halving. The price is going to go up a bit, just like it did with the ETF. Then it's going to drop down a little bit. And then it's going to be summertime. So currently it's April, May, June, July, August. Then it's going to be summertime. During the summer, nobody really cares about what's happening in the world of finance. Everybody's taking vacations. Everybody's in the Western world anyways. Everybody's in summer mode. So I think that we're going to have from now until, let's say, September. And this is exactly what happened in the 2020 halving. In September, October, November, that's where it went from $6,000 to $60,000. So 10 x last halving. That was without the ETFs. That was without everybody probably that's watching the show today. It went from 6,000 to 60,000 in May to October because of that. And I think that the exact same thing is going to happen here. And so if you consider who's buying all this Bitcoin right now, BlackRock, why are they buying it? That's what we're going to talk about on the second part of the show today. But they're going to continue buying as much Bitcoin as they possibly can this summer. And although they don't care what the price is, the reason why they're keeping the price down right now and why we saw a big crash on the weekend is not because they, they don't want to pay that price. It's because they don't want any eyes on Bitcoin. They don't want you. They don't want your parents. They don't want your friends, your coworkers. They don't want any sort of eyes on Bitcoin yet. So we're going to get through the halving. It's probably going to flatline a bit. Summer's going to go. It's going to slowly rise. And then in September, October, November, last time it went 10x. So if we 10x from today, what's that? 600,000? Definitely not out of question. Definitely not out of question. So that's what I think is going to happen. Nothing crazy, but I do think that it's important not to put too much stock into the having here. You have to consider where we are. You have to consider what season, what season we're in, spring, summer. Not, nothing ever happens in the summer in terms of the financial world. Everything happens in the fall. So even though it probably feels like every time the price goes up to 70, 72, that you're going to miss out out here. And like I said, this is just my prediction on it. This could be completely off. But you still have some time and you have time to be buying. You should be taking this next six months and doing every single thing that you possibly can to earn Bitcoin, to sell everything that you have that you don't need in your house for Bitcoin, to maybe stop buying your lunch every week or every day at, at work, start bringing lunch, start putting every single penny, every single nickel, every single dime you have into Bitcoin, because this is coming. And I think it's going to happen not faster than people think, but bigger than people think. It's going to be very, once it gets past $100,000, that's when retail is going to get into it. That's when the FOMO is going to kick in. And all around this time, while BlackRock, while the Hong Kong ETFs, while they're trying to get as much as they can, the block reward gets cut in half. So the supply cuts in half. So when will mass adoption occur? When that happens, let's say that, let's take a very conservative Based on that prediction, I said 600,000. That's what would happen if it repeats from last time. I think it'll go higher than that. But let's say that it gets to 600,000. <laughs> when mass adoption happens, people are going to want, they're going to need to want Bitcoin. That's, that's the next phase of this. 
people are going to need to want Bitcoin. So we have the we have the early adopters. We have the big corporations. Then we have the rest of the people. Then we have the countries. That's kind of the progression here. So I think that mass adoption will occur probably sometime in the next couple of years. Once Bitcoin gets to a price high enough where people actually want it compared to dollars, they start asking their boss about it. They start leaving their job and earning Bitcoin. That's when mass adoption happens. And then once people have that Bitcoin, businesses will start accepting it because people have Bitcoin now. They want to, they want to use it. So probably in the next couple of years, although it could be a decade. But if you look at where we are on the S curve right now, we're just getting off the start of the, we're, we're at the very, in the first inning here, not even, we're in warmups. So that's my prediction there. That's my thoughts on where we're going, where we are, and when mass adoption happens. And think about how much leverage you're going to have when mass adoption kicks in. Uh, big shout out over on zap.stream to Nick. Uh, zapped 2.1 thousand sats. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very, very much for that. But it says Bitcoin is for anyone who is willing to do the work and learn about it. First time tuning into the show. Keep it up. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> okay. I love that. So hopefully I missed a lot here. <laughs> Everybody knows these uh, expressions except for me. I did see, uh, oh, so Daniel says it's 15,000 with a 250 monthly VIG. What's a VIG? Pretty steep for a K1. Oh, I thought it was cheaper than that. I thought it was cheaper than that. I kind of see it as like a Bitcoin miner though. You're getting you're getting KYC. No, you're not. You could if you turn that cash into Bitcoin. Anyways, let's move past that. Um, <laughs> yeah, Brendan says Bitcoin is a classic Portuguese accent. <laughs> Johnny says 100,000 is the mag magic number for mass adoption. I agree with that. Uh, Tommy says many investors and mining companies have been encouraging the ex executives to keep the Bitcoin in treasury. That's another thing I want to talk about, which we didn't get to today, is the treasuries. I saw that the Winklevoss twins invested in uh, Bedford, real Bedford soccer team. So they're going to put some of that Bitcoin on the treasury. And maybe that's a, a separate conversation for another day. Okay. Yes. King says supply gets cut in half. BlackRock and China will want more and be willing to pay for it, driving prices up. Even Bitcoiners are underestimating what's going to happen in Bitcoin over this next year. So don't, ex moral of the story, don't expect it to happen next week when the halving kicks in. Nothing does. Everything takes time. There's always a lag there. Um, as the ETF has shown, there's always a lag there because think about how everything works. Not every person in China is going to just want Bitcoin all of a sudden tomorrow. Not every financial institution in Hong Kong is going to be knowledgeable enough to sell Bitcoin to their clients yet. There's a lag there. And eventually that lag gets to retail, like people like me and you. With this, we actually have the ability to front run all of these people. And that's what you should be focused on right now. That's where every single minute, every single hour of your day should be spent, is trying to figure out how you can earn Bitcoin, how you can get more Bitcoin and how you can earn Bitcoin. Every single day. Okay. So let's move over here. I want to say we're going to we're going to hop over to the private sh server. We're going to watch a video. It's about 50 minutes long. And I think it's going to change the way you think about Bitcoin completely. Because this show ties directly into that. Everybody's underestimating Bitcoin and what's happening here with the BlackRocks, with the Hong Kongs, with the tokenization of our new economy here. Everybody's sleeping on this. And so I want you to listen to these 15 minutes. We're going to talk about it. And I think, like I said, it's going to change the way you think about Bitcoin. And once you see it, as the video says, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. So I think that there's a huge race happening right now. And uh, Corey from Swan, 
I don't love Swan Bitcoin, but Corey from Swan, this was his his keynote last year at uh, their conference, Pacific Bitcoin. But he said it's a race to win the war, and it is. The race is on between us and BlackRock, Bitcoiners and BlackRock. And whoever can accumulate all of that Bitcoin, that's what BlackRock is doing behind the scenes right now. They're getting as much as they possibly can because they want to try to control the future monetary system, the future economy. That's what BlackRock's doing, which we're going to talk about here. Uh, but it's a race. So the better you can understand this, I think the more conviction you're going to have and the more, the harder you're going to work to get Bitcoin and get all of the people that you love in your life into Bitcoin. So that's where we are today. We're going to hop over there. The description, it says living in the future. You can join it just for today even. You can join for seven days for free. Um, on that note, we have about just less than 40 people in that group right now. We have a group chat, very active. It's splitting off different subsets. There's a mining group. There's a media group. There's a new Linux group in there. And when, once we get to 44 members, we're going to cut it off. That's going to be the new. They're going to be called the visionaries. They're the people who can see have the vision of what's coming in the future and how to take advantage of that. So we're going to open it up after that. But for, for now, we're going to keep it at 44 people. And so if you are somebody who's been on the fence, today would be a good time to do it. You're going to want to watch this. So with that, I hope you have the best Monday of your life today. I appreciate everybody who's who's been in here today over on zap.stream and YouTube. A lot of new faces today. And uh, I really look forward to what's coming here. You just have, you have to prepare for it. And that's what we're doing. So if I don't see you over on Living in the Future, we'll see you right back here first thing tomorrow morning. Anything you need from me, contact info, Living in the Future, everything is below here in the description. So with that, let's cut off YouTube. Let's cut off Zap.stream and we'll see everybody over on Living in the Future. Bye-bye.